Welcome to the fourth in a series we are calling L&D's Pivot to Performance, in which Guy Wallace and myself, David James, speak with esteemed guests about their own pivot from learning focused practice towards a performance orientation that more predictably and reliably, let alone efficiently and successfully, achieves demonstrable results for both employees and organizations. Over a total of seven sessions, each two weeks apart, we're inviting guests that we know have made the pivot and have achieved real results from doing so. We'll invite our guests to share their stories, we'll question them on their approaches, and encourage them to share relatable experiences to either inspire or initiate um, your own pivot to performance. We'll also seek opportunities to get you involved as much as we can too. Guy, would you like to add anything at this stage? No, that was great, David. Thanks. Um, but Guy, how about we begin with some introductions uh, and our own pivot to performance? Um, would you like to kick us off? Sure, thanks. So I was uh, one of the lucky few, I think, in that my pivot began on day one uh, when I got out of college and joined a small training and development organization. And I was immediately oriented to the works and the thinking of the late Gary Rumler, the late Tom Gilbert, and the late Bob Mager. They were very much alive back then in 1979. But uh, so I was given and taught this orientation towards performance for developing what we call back in the day training or instruction. And now, of course, it's learning and development or learning experience design. Um, and I've uh, been a consultant since 1982. And my practice as a consultant has been mainly in the learning and development world where I carried forward what I learned from some of the gurus way back then uh, in a performance-oriented or performance-based instruction. Thanks, Guy. Um, and by way of introduction, um, I um, I can't go uh, back as far as Guy, but uh, but I certainly joined a profession before it was called learning and development back in the training days, uh, and I became skilled in the uh, the arts of uh, of training delivery and training design. Built curriculums, introduced e-learning, launched LMSs, and then landed myself a senior job at Disney when I was asked to actually help with the transformation. Of, uh, of skills, capabilities, and people's ability to do their jobs in entire countries and functions and realize that without a performance orientation, that just wasn't possible. And so almost the apprenticeship that I served was far less complete than, uh, than I thought it was. And it took very different types of conversations uh, and solutions in order to actually affect the way that entire populations actually did their work. Uh, I left Disney uh, frustrated that technology wasn't actually uh, equipping the, any of the organizations that I worked in to actually help with this stuff. So that's when I exited and decided that technology has to do more of the heavy lifting than just providing e-learning courses that people were actively resisting, if not ignoring. And so here we are having these conversations about, uh, about what others have done um, that's similar to us uh, in order to affect the actual way that people do the jobs themselves and the results that they get. But that's enough about us, and it's time for our guest this week. And Guy, I'll hand over to you to make the introduction. Thank you. Today we have with us Dr. Don Snyder. Uh, Don, thank you so much for agreeing to do this with us today. Could you, for our audience, please give us a little bit about your background in the L&D space? Sure. Thank you, Guy. And thank you, David. I'm excited to be here today. And thank you to everyone who's listening. Um, I think performance is an important topic in L&D. Um, I currently am in three roles. I'm a consultant, I'm a business owner, and I'm also a university professor. And so what I do is I work with my clients and organizations to solve performance problems. And in the L&D space, that involves usually the creation of a learning strategy and designing a curriculum. I'm usually working on initiatives where there's a large uh, change in the organization or a long-term capacity building strategy that needs to be put in place. So um, I've always been focused on this long-term workforce development and significant changes that affect a lot of people. And I got into this, I got into the field because I was very interested in the fact that educational systems can empower and enable people or they can disenfranchise people. So true. Thank you, Don, for that introduction. Um, 
beginning with our first question here, can you share with us a little bit about your your story, uh, your personal pivot to performance? You know, what was normal for you beforehand? What was the cause of your aha moment? And uh, how did you carry on from there? Well, that's an interesting question, because like you, Guy, I began learning about instructional design and learning um, when I started my formal education at Indiana University. So I do have a PhD in instructional systems. And again, I went into instructional systems because I really wanted to have an impact. And so as I continued to learn about instruction and how people learn and all the kinds of things that make up a traditional educational program, I also became very interested in transfer of training. Um, Organizations at this point, the business cycles were decreasing and we were really starting to, to look at learning and development functions and say, so what are you doing to add value to the organization? You're not just a, um, you know, a cost center. We're looking to you to have an impact on organizational performance. So transfer of training was really about how do we get the skills and the capabilities we're teaching in the classroom to be applied on the job? To do that, I had to learn how to measure it. So I had to learn how to measure what was happening on the job. And because I developed that skill set, I ended up doing a lot of work in that space, both both for projects that I would get from my own clients, as well as colleagues who would say, oh, I haven't done that before. Can you join me in my project? And we'll evaluate the impact that we're having. What I learned, and it was really eye-opening and a little bit concerning, is that a lot of the things... That's how concerning it is. It took my headset (laughs) right off. Um, A lot of the things that we were doing in the learning space had no impact. Once that learning was done, nothing transferred to the job. There were no measurable impacts in the organization. And so because I had that experience of measurement, I was able to go back and look at the things that really did make a difference. And approach all my work, and I would say the secret to my success today is that I approach all of my work through a performance mindset. Thank you. So let's let's begin to explore maybe at just the top level here, because we'll dive in deeper in our next question. But uh, so how would you describe your overall approach to this? You know, how do you start? What do you go to next and how do you kind of wrap up that effort? And then again, we'll circle back and and try to do a deep dive into your approach to this. Okay. Um, Well, that's a great question. And I would love to tell you that there is a repeatable process that I do step A and step B and step C. But the truth is, is that um, the key, I think, to being successful in impacting performance is to have a, a toolkit of research strategies that help you focus on the problem at hand. So um, wherever you go in and whatever you're, you're asked to do, the first key is to focus on the results that you're expected to obtain on behalf of the organization and the people in it. And given that, I think the two main approaches that distinguish a performance approach in uh, learning and development from other kinds of approaches are gap analysis and cause analysis, because we're really working with systems and performance is a complicated, um, a complicated thing to impact. So I would say that um, I look for what are the gaps? What are, are we actually achieving um, that we need to be able to do? And what's the desired state? And then where are there gaps? Where are there deficiencies or problems or opportunities that the organization has an interest in addressing? And you pair that with then the cause analysis. So once you identify and understand what these gaps are, then you're able to look at, is it something that can be addressed even with a a learning intervention? Is it a knowledge and skills deficit? 
Or is there another performance influencer that is contributing to the problem that we would need to consider as part of our solution set? And to gather this data, I think probably the main techniques I use would be looking at business data that the organization currently gathers. What have they decided that good looks like? Um, What are they measuring? What are they looking at? Um, Using interview data. So structured interviews, not casual discussions, but structured interviews where we're looking to understand, um, again, what that desired state is and what's currently happening. Um, And then expanding that oftentimes through group interviews or focus groups and or surveys so that we can take what we've learned and validate that with a larger population in order to feel confident about the solutions that we recommend. And all those things together, I would call performance analysis. Um, There's a lot written about it. A lot of our thought leaders have, have contributed different ideas and approaches to that world. Yes, that's so true. There are many, many roads to uh, performance analysis. And that's help right. Pivot. Yeah. So let's go back a little bit. So you've got the desired state and then you're looking for gaps and you're looking at data, business data and, and what, how things are measured. Can you, can you share with us a little bit more about the specifics of that? What kinds of data, what kinds of measures are you typically looking at um, to define both that desired state and then the gaps? Well, it, it actually depends on an organization um, and what their focus is. So if an organization comes to me and says something like, um, you know, our, our group is not able to perform this function, they're not able to sell this product, Uh, to this market, then I would like to look at any data they have that informs that performance. And that might include um, current sales data, past sales data, um, projected trends for performance. It might look at uh, the difference between low performing and high performing salespeople, people who are successful at doing that work and people who are not, so that we could um, compare, um, first of all, their data, and then through interviews and perhaps other interventions, we would dig into that more deeply to understand what are the behaviors or the accomplishments that our high performers are focusing on that would distinguish their um, ability to get organizational results from the low performers. Um, I would also be looking for uh, information from um, individuals and any other data about what kind of barriers they're experiencing when they're doing what they're asked to do. You know, do they have, uh, have they been given good expectations and feedback? Do they have the tools they need to do their job? Um, Are they incented to do that? So, A lot of times if you take people and train them to do X, but you actually reward them for something different, um, you can pretty much kiss that training effort goodbye when it comes comes to the job. There are some few folks like me who will probably beat their heads against the system and try to do things what they consider the right way. But we need to understand what are all those different things that influence performance. And based on what performance we're looking at, there's different data. The the other thing I'd like to say about data is that in the past three to five years, I have found organizations and the use of systems is become so ubiquitous that there's a lot more systems data that are available to us that didn't used to be available. And that gives us sometimes good clues for performance and sometimes it just obscures everything. So you have to really, there's not a specific type of data that you can look at and existing data doesn't always illuminate uh, the performance that we're focusing on, but that data along with the other 
focused, once you say, well, I need to learn more about this, then figuring out how to get that information in a way that makes sense would be your next move. It's a problem solving approach. And in doing that problem solving approach, you're kind of like filling in the outside of a puzzle and then determining what you need to know to fill out the inside. That's where the gap and cause analysis help us understand what we need to know to take action. Thank you for that. So it, that was uh, mostly on uh, the uh, uh, desired state and looking at the data for that. And you mentioned uh, both the gap analysis and cause analysis. You right. With us, how you look at causes? Do you have a framework, a model that you use to differentiate causes that then you would align solutions toward? Yes, absolutely. So it's very difficult to gather data on just like desired state. So when you're, you're looking at the interviews and things like that, you're trying to figure out, you know, why that's the desired state and, and what else is going on. Um, when you get to cause analysis and knowing what filter I'm using for causes is going to be the behavioral engineering model. I'm very influenced by uh, Gilbert um, in, in the sense of looking at causes. And there are updates, of course, to that model that you'll find, um, you know, Reiser's done them, Chevalier's done them, Carl Binder's done them. There are just a lot of updates to that model, but it's a really wonderful way to isolate and categorize performance influences, if only to distinguish them from knowledge and skill type influences and categories of other things that are contributing to the performance deficit or opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So the behavior engineering model was uh, in the work uh, the book and prior work uh, of Tom Gilbert, the late Tom Gilbert, in his uh, 1978 mm -hmm. That's right. Human Competence. So I just wanted to mention that so that people Thank that you. go off with that. And the behavior engineering model is uh, sometimes called the six boxes. I think Carl Binder popularized that. So there yes. are, again, many resources for people to follow up on that. So tell us, a, can, you, can you share with us a, a story of, uh, of a project that you had where you you did look at what the desired state was and the gap analysis and did your cost analysis and then that led you to various solutions? Absolutely. And thank you for asking that question because I love to talk shop. But, you know, <laughs> I, I would start every project, even if it's a learning project, with at least a cursory performance analysis. So let me tell you about a client in the financial services industry and they, they did really great work, but they had a curriculum um, for, one, for a class of their financial products, annuities. And they had a call center where um, these call center employees supported professionals who sold this product as well as customers. And they brought these new hires in. The new hires didn't know some of them didn't even have checking accounts. And now they're going to be answering questions and supporting the use of these complicated financial products. And they said to me, it started as a question, right? So we need to reduce our nine week new hire curriculum to five weeks. Can, can you do that? And I said, sure, we can, we can take a look at it. Um, and we may have to do some things differently. Is that okay with you? So we need to go in and do some exploration. So I started out by gathering data on performance. You know, what do we expect our novice new hires to be able to do on the job? And there were a variety of things that we looked at. So in that organization, in any call center, there are call metrics. Um, that include things like how long are you on the call and do you have to transfer the call to somebody else? There are call quality criteria um, in terms of establishing rapport with the customer, providing accurate product information. So they had some of those things to find. Um, they gathered data on customer service. So there were a lot of rich pieces of information as well as systems 
data about uh, why did people call? What was the call about? And so that was a confluence of things that told me what the organization was looking at. So we worked to define the desired state of performance after the curriculum. And we also looked at what was currently working or not working about the curriculum. And one of the first things I heard, which is a performance red flag, is we always have to retrain people the minute they've left the curriculum. All right, so here are people who are spending nine weeks learning how to do this work and they have to be retrained immediately after leaving. Uh Uh-oh, something is really wrong here. Anyway, so we look at the desired state and and I said, you can't expect people to do everything your, your experienced employees do after new hire training. So we got very crisp about what we expected. And then we started gathering in a targeted way through interviews and some other information, more information about who was successful and who wasn't, where were the problems in the curriculum, um, what were the main complaints of the managers who inherited these newly trained new hires, what challenges did the trainers experience, and you start running that through a behavioral engineering model. And, you know, it's, it's a toolbox to let us know that there are a variety of things happening that influence performance besides designing a really effective knowledge and skills curriculum. And just a couple of those things, um, not to, you know, give a lot of different trade secrets away, but one of the things we found is that um, the professional employer organization who was actually hiring and holding these folks as employees for a year did not have clear hiring criteria given to them by my client. All right, so they weren't always selecting the right group of people. So we added that to the effort to create the curriculum where we were teaching knowledge and skills to get crisper about the selection criteria for people who would be taking on this job. Another thing we learned is that people were going through the entire training and then even after they'd been on the job for a few months being fired because they couldn't get to work on time and they didn't follow the dress code, which at that time was important, okay? Um, Those were things that were observed on day one. So why are we having these issues continue after we've made these huge investments in knowledge and skill development in these people? So we decided that their expectations and the consequences for following these guidelines that were critical to success on the job were not being communicated effectively. So we created very early in the training a guidelines piece and then instructed the trainers how to observe and give feedback on a daily basis on those things that were most problematic about those little behaviors and interfering with performance. So you see, none of those things have anything to do really with the curriculum itself and the knowledge and skills, but they had a lot to do with the things that influenced the performance of these folks. Um, I think another thing that um, we learned is that we were not expect, we were expecting people to do everything. This is what I call the content model or the exposure model. Um, And I, I shouldn't think of it this way, but it's like a guy in a raincoat, you know, I'm going to show you this and therefore I'm going to change your life. And it really doesn't work that way. So we use the system data that we had to say, we don't need to train people for the calls that they receive once every three months. We don't need to include that in new hire training. We can look at the performances and the accomplishments based on the most common types of calls and also the types of calls that are um, most critical to the success of the organization. And we're going to exclude everything else for now 
and focus on these things that are most important to influencing the customer satisfaction, the call quality, and those call metrics that are really, really critical is how we you know, live and die by our call center. And then probably the other thing that I will mention is related to practice. Um, what we were doing, and you know, we often design training programs for the convenience of the people who implement them. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think you do. Oh, yeah. So what we had were the systems people came in and taught new hires how to use the system. Then they left. And then the customer service people came in and taught people how to deal with customers. And they left. And the products, product people came in and said, these are our products. And then they left. And these poor new hires who never had checking accounts and were expected to support these complicated financial products were left to try to put all of these pieces together in a way that made sense for performance. So we looked at what they had to do on the job and we reverse engineered all the practices and all the content to be geared towards preparing them to do those things that they had to do on the job. And the practice mimicked exactly what they did on the job. Okay, so instead of giving them written tests over what the products were, maybe we did that early in the cycle just to make sure they had the concepts, they had to talk. People in call centers talk. It's like, you know, I work with college curricula sometimes and we want people to be able to write. And when they graduate, they have to write reports. Why are we having them design t-shirts, right? Because it's fun, but it doesn't prepare people to do the work they need to do. So you can see, I get very passionate about how the data that we gather about performance can be used. And I'll tell you, that when we first ran this new curriculum, not only did we reduce from nine weeks to five as requested, but in the last few days when the new hires were in a special um, supported environment, taking actual calls from customer with a coach that was easily available to them to make sure that the customers didn't suffer because that's one of my pet peeves, right? We let people practice on our customers. No, we don't like that. They were able to save the company $3 million, which exceeded what the experienced group was able to do by helping people understand why a current financial product wasn't performing well and that it was a result of the environment and not a deficiency in the product because that was one of the organizational measures that we needed to focus on. And therefore the training, everything in the training was focused on getting that impact on the job. Does this make sense? To me, yes, it's just no. kind of, it's common <laughs> sense. We want people to do X and we spend our time on something completely different. Too true, too sad. Um, let me, uh, let me shift our, our gears here a little bit. And uh, David's been tracking the questions. And uh, David, what, what, what questions can we share with Dawn and see what, she what kind of answers she has for our visitors? Yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah, thanks, Dawn. It, first of all, it, uh, make, it makes huge sense. And uh, what you just described there is, uh, uh, is, the, is the reason why people don't, can't measure the effectiveness of, uh, of courses they have on their curriculum because they're delivered their, their, their content to be delivered yes hopefully that it will just tick some boxes and that it will land somehow into people's work context but without any analysis as to whether it actually will what you've just described there i love it you start where the work is and then you you scrape your data Absolutely. dependent upon what people are actually measured uh, within the work to figure out what actually needs working it, of course it makes perfect sense um, but but I think it makes greater sense in 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 contrast to to the um, to the status quo. Now we we have uh, we have questions. Um, first of all, um, there was a, there was an interesting thread uh, in the chat uh, and that uh, that Frank started uh, and and uh, start and um, started his question with what about speed to competency 
as a metric, um, which which continued down the path of um, uh, um, uh, Heather asking, do we need to measure speed to forgetting then? Uh, for which Frank replied, uh, when you approach learning as a tool for performance support, it becomes an ongoing task of calibrating your, your employees and not a once in a while task of training. And Charles uh, intervened and said, wouldn't that be speed to performance? So I wonder whether you'd, you'd comment on, uh, sure. on that, Dawn. So um, I'm pretty influenced by Carl Binder in this respect. And we're talking about, in some sense, the concept of fluency. So mastery and accuracy, speed and accuracy are the two components of fluency. So one of the things you have to do in your performance analysis is determine, and so I used an example of new hires, so I didn't have to give you a lot of context. You knew they didn't have anything coming in, but you really have to work with your stakeholders to define how fluent people need to be after training. Again, fluency being how fast, how accurate. So if they need to be able to look something up in a system and they put a customer on hold to do that, how long can that customer be on hold? That's a function of how much you have to practice in your training environment in order to get that speed and accuracy on the floor. One of the things that I would look at is how common is the task that we're training somebody to do. Are they going to practice it 27 times an hour once they leave training? Because in that case, if I can focus on accuracy, they can build speed over time. However, it's a, if it's a very occasional task, then I either need to build fluency or to um, share something my mentor Guy Wallace and Harless and others would say, we need to give them some sort of support that they can refer to at that point of performance. And what we need to train them on in training is how they recognize that they need to go and look at that thing so that when they do the task, they're able to get the accuracy and the speed of of what we need to do on the job. And again, those criteria aren't dictated by trainers. They're dictated by what has to happen on the job. Mm -hmm. And we get in trouble as trainers when we don't ask those questions, when we make assumptions and we focus on content. I see a lot of folks, let's skip practice because we can squeeze in more content. And if anything, my advice is to flip that. Focus on your practice and present less content. Show people where to find the content and you will transform your training programs, your learning experiences into something of value. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Dawn. Um, so we have a question from Charles Jennings. Um, uh, towards the end of his career, W. Edwards Deming wrote, I should estimate that in my experience, most organizational performance problems and most possibilities for improvement add up to the proportions, something like this. 94% belongs to the system, responsibility of management, and 6% special, the performer. In addressing problems and opportunities in your experience, Dawn, do you see <laughs> this general pattern? If so, are your solutions predominantly fixing systems rather than people? Oh, gosh, you guys, thanks for putting me on the spot. So in a perfect world, I would spend my time fixing systems. Um, and I think I'm not telling you anything you don't know that we don't live in a perfect world. And if that's news to you, I'm really sorry to share that in today's podcast. But one of the things that I have learned to do is by doing a compelling analysis and a cause analysis and appropriately involving my client in the data collection analysis and interpretation, I can often get buy-in into other elements of solving the problem that are outside of the scope of learning and development. So in other words, if I find that, and it's, it's I agree, that it's often the case that people management just hasn't shared expectations and they don't 
apply consequences or incentives to the performances that they want to see. You know, when I was raising my kids and they didn't do something that I required them to do, I just removed privileges. I didn't have to have big conversations because people often know what they're supposed to do, but the environment in which they're expected to perform doesn't support that performance. And so, you know, my husband would tell my son, go clean your room. Well, I would sit with him and say, this is what a clean room looks like. And if you don't clean your room, you don't leave the house. That's all I had to say. I didn't have to teach him how to pick a garment up off the floor. And sometimes we get all tangled up in these behaviors rather than fixing the environment. And I would agree if we can fix the system and even the system tools, if they're, if your system is poorly designed, I'll bet there are people on the call that can tell, tell me chapter and verse of having to design training to work around a poorly designed system or some sort of legacy system that no longer supports the performance expected today. So I would agree. And, and the key is, and I've, I'm fortunate in my career that I am typically working with C-suite. I'm looking at high stakes performance initiatives, and I usually am able to work with my sponsor to get energy around some of these other solutions. Am I successful 100% of the time? No. And sometimes we have to live with that because as I said before, we're not in a perfect world. We can only take our clients from where they are and, and push them and nudge them and pull them and share with them and educate them to get them further down the road to support the performance in their, in their own workplace. Wonderful. Thanks, Dawn. And I'm sure that, uh, that the, what you've described so far, that beginning with data and evidence-based mm-hmm. um, so, um, analysis, you're going you're gonna to be talking with your stakeholder about m- measures that are important to the performance and the results of uh, their function. And of course, the evidence is the experience of those people you're seeking to influence. I think that once you start there and everybody can see what that experience is and where the deficiencies are, they can either go for a gold, silver or bronze or perhaps further down the ladder um, yes. solution because everybody will see that it's a system problem as much as, much as if not more than, than an individual uh, performance problem. But, uh, but if, you, yeah, if you don't start from, uh, from data and evidence-based practice and you start where a lot of uh, initiatives begin, which is with minimal observation, then it's all left to interpretation. I suppose it doesn't really matter what you do. Yes, you get a group of people around the table talking about how to fix a problem that hasn't yet been defined. Mm. And when you do that, um, you're, you're arguing about the colors that mm. are going to be in your e-learning and not whether or not you should have e-learning at all or whether or not you should do something entirely different and just give people a, a job aid and, and that will, will solve the problem. Mm. Uh, I've got one more question, if that's uh, if uh, if we've got time. Uh, one from uh, from Kira. Um, uh, she's asked Dawn from uh, your case study. Uh, did you get any pushback from the client based on your analysis and implementation plan? Yes. Um, so there's a reason that change management is one of the best skills that you can develop as a. Um, as someone who works in the performance improvement space. And so one of the things that you identify in your performance analysis is what are the barriers? And and one of the barriers that we often encounter when we're taking learning and development and pivoting it to have a performance focus is that people have an idea about what you do. It's based on what their third grade teacher did to teach them content. And so one of the barriers you often have is that you're supposed to be in this box, yet we now have a contemporary idea that, that from this box, you can solve these problems. Well, you, you can't staff and operate like the 1980s and get contemporary results. You just can't do it that way. So um, I am very purposeful about bringing the right people to the table and getting buy-in. And I have more than once 
been sitting around a table, it's pre-COVID days, right, with a group of people who have their arms crossed because I and are looking at me, you know, that closed body language look that you, you don't like to see, but you get sometimes and and working with them to say, we can do this if you just try it. And so my keys there are get them to agree to a pilot test so that they know that it's not going to kill them. You know, when, when we partner and we share accountability, that means that our stakeholders can't throw stuff over the the organizational boundary and say, learning, this is your problem. We have to work together to do it. And that means a different way for all of us to look at our roles and how we get results together. And so you are asking people to change. You're asking yourself to change and you're asking your teams to do things differently. Is that concrete enough? That's great. Okay. Thanks, Dawn. Well, thank you, Dawn, for that. And my, my next question, uh, you, you've answered some of this already, but what suggestions do you have for others in adopting and adapting your approach? So, um, so what I'm looking for here is some highlights and maybe pointing to some people and books and articles that had influence uh, to you that, that others may want to follow up with. But uh, so you know it's not an easy thing, and you've already kind of talked about that. So in helping people begin to make this pivot to performance or to continue their uh, journey towards performance, what suggestions would you have for them? Oh, that's a great question. So my first suggestion is to focus on the results that your organization is looking for. That means you need to get out of the function that you're in and you need to get out and learn what reports are generated, how those reports are calculated. Um, Back in the day, I did some work with with Apple and there was a $500 million cost of warranty and they were worried about how service technicians were being trained. And when we did the performance analysis, we learned that it was actually a policy that was in place for how people got reimbursed and the training had nothing to do with anything. Service calls weren't reimbursed unless somebody pulled apart. So people would take a part out of the equipment in order to package it with their reimbursement. Um, So focus on results and understand how those measures come to be, what they tell us and what they don't tell us. So that would be my first thing. And it also means when someone comes to you and says, can we do training on this? You say yes, but then you start to investigate the problem. So once you focus on results, then you begin to get into the opportunity to do some performance analysis. And gosh, I could tell you, I've got sitting here um, Van Team Mosley and Dessinger's Fundamentals of Performance Improvement. I've got Rumler's Serious Performance Consulting. I got, I've got Rothwell's um, Human Performance Improvement that also describes what practitioner skill sets you should have to do performance improvement. But my big pick for the second thing, besides learning to focus on results and, and measures, would be getting your analysis skills as sharp as they can be. Learn to do an interview. Learn to systematically gather and interpret data. So you can go to Gilbert. You can go to Rumler. I don't care whose model you use, but use somebody's. And for techniques, I pulled this off my shelf. I've got, I've got, I have a book problem. So I have lots of books, but uh, Judy Hales, let me see if I can get this in focus. All right, it's got an orange cover. The Performance Consultants Field Book describes how to do interviews, how to do focus groups, how to do nominal group technique, and how to take that data and use it in a performance lens. So if you're looking for some how-to, you know, guys packed process is something that's guided a lot of my efforts. And so there are a lot of 
authors who are out there, try to find something that matches your context. And again, focus on results, do a performance analysis of some kind. Any analysis is better than no analysis at all. That reminds me of uh, Joe Harless's uh, book, An Ounce of Analysis. An Ounce of Analysis, yes. Is worth a pound of objectives. And he was really taking a poke at his very good buddy, Bob Mager, who yes. taught us all how to prepare instructional objectives. Um, Dawn, this has been a, a fabulous uh, uh, sharing that you've done with people. Um, and thank you for the, the call out and for identifying some of the people, because you and I have have run in the same circle yes, yes. Right, society. And, and there are a lot of great models and methods and descriptions and case studies of people who have focused on performance, even though the request may have come for training or instruction or learning experiences nowadays. I think that one of the key things that I remember learning from the late Joe Harless was he said, yes, you say yes to those requests. Yes, always yes. And, and then you, you, then you find some way to begin to conduct a performance analysis and, and bringing your clients in, I think is one of the key things that uh, many of the gurus from the past taught us. So when, when you've gotten some resistance though, from people about doing anything like analysis, how do you navigate that barrier, that rock in the road? Well, I'm glad you asked me about that. And if anyone else has suggestions, please let me know. Um, there is an increasing resistance to doing analysis, um, in part because our business cycles are shorter, the shelf life of our training is shorter, and people uh, basically don't want to open up a can of worms. Yet our organizations are increasingly out of line uh, with each other. There's, there's a lack of alignment among the levels because of all the changes, the rapid changes and, and what's happening. So um, basically, you know, I try a common sense of a problem solving approach. Most people don't solve problems in their personal lives without doing some research first. And so my goal is to figure out what my client's tolerance is and push them as far past that as I think I can get away with. Um, and a lot of times, if I can begin to show how some closely held ideas or um, perspectives are not suiting the organization any longer and that my client can then be in the know and be more effective. Um, it's, it's not just about, about money, but, you know, what drives me is curiosity. I'm just an intensely curious person. And I would love to talk to each and every one on this call about their own experiences, right? But Getting past that resistance has to do with, you know, understanding why it's there. And it's often time. It's often, everyone's going to tell me something different anyway, so I can't do anything with that information. But a competent analyst can tell you that the reason you get those differences is those are coming from two different stakeholding groups. So if you have, if your groups can't agree on a time for a meeting and you find out that it's the individual contributors that want it during the day and the managers that want it at night, then your solution to that might be to meet the needs of your individual contributors during the day and the managers at night. I, I mean, it's a, a way of, you have to be adept at looking at data and understanding how how that information can help you move those levers to impact performance. Thank you. David, do we have any more questions from our audience? We don't from the audience, but, uh, but I've got uh, a question, Dawn. Sure. Um, so um, when, when looking to introduce a, uh, a new approach, it can seem pretty scary for, uh, for, for learning and development. That, uh, and, uh, and sometimes that resistance may manifest in us that instead of trying something, we seek permission uh, which of course is never going to come because we've, you know, as, as you said earlier, people mm -hmm. have lower expectations of what learning and development do, let alone yes. conceive. Um, and um, whether it's a, a lack of capability or a lack of confidence, 
it might not go so well first time. So I just wonder, are there any common pitfalls that you see of uh, from 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 people, your clients, when they are looking to initially make that pivot that you can kind of recognize and then and then kind of help or coach them through, if not just to persist, but but to begin from a place where they're more likely to to have uh, a, a positive experience. Yes, I would say um, that's a great question. I would say the first thing I would recommend is to start small Mm. and to find um, stakeholders who are a little bit more open to doing things differently. Um, Don't pick the toughest nut to crack first time out, but do pick something of value. And if you begin to build successes, those things snowball into other successes. And you can then point in your organization and say, well, so-and-so tried this with us. And, you know, it worked pretty well. Um, maybe you could talk to them or, uh, you know, I, you know, one of your other guests, uh, Sebastian, had talked about an intake Uh, where you get your clients by asking them good questions about why they want to do what you do. Sometimes you're raising their awareness because a lot of times they haven't thought about it. People are busy. They're slammed. Mm. And when you say, what would be the business impact of this? Who is impacted by it? What would happen if we did nothing? What successes have you had in the past with an intervention like this one? So by asking really good questions, um, but you need to start small, um, start where you think you can get some success and then begin to spread your skills and expertise and your own wings a little bit further. That's what I would do. That's great. Thanks, Dawn. But no, no other questions uh, at this point, Guy? I, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much a wrap. And uh, uh, thank you, Don, for, for sharing with us, as you have, and uh, for pointing to some resources and some people that uh, others, I think, should follow up with. Because a lot of this has been addressed in the past, and there's a long, long history yes. of a performance orientation. It is not a mystery And there are plenty of very good, valid, proven models and methods to doing this. So you you really, if you kind of, you know, explore that a little bit, pick one and start. And I think your advice was good that you you start with something small and you start with something that's uh, with somebody with a friendly who's willing to something like this. And then you can point to that. When you're working in an organization, you can build your credibility that way. And I think that you can't, make perfection the enemy of good. And yes. so you go for everything if you can. If you can begin to nudge your practice and the impact that you're having in your organization, it's a start. You can't make that giant leap. So we should probably also mention the International Society for Performance Improvement has a lot of resources and access to people. The Association for Talent Development, one of the areas in the ATD capability model is human performance improvement. Um, And something like Learning Development Accelerator as an organization has a lot of people who are performance focused because once you're evidence-based, you're about performance in my view. So um, you guys, there's so many things out there you can You can access it. Some of it's more academic. Some of it's less academic. You just need to be brave enough to move in the right direction. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thanks, Dawn. Um, And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, for attending today. Thank you all. Oh, and the Hale Center. Yes, (laughs) absolutely. Um, I we have got. uh, we will be following up with everybody with a copy of the um, uh, of the uh, recording uh, which we've been which we've been doing today. Um, well, there'll be a uh, a video uh, of that, and we'll also pop it on the uh, on the Learning Development Podcast as well. Uh, please join us in two weeks' time when we have uh, Philip Lamb from Klarna joining us, uh, and that will be on. Uh, That'll be great. Correct. 
uh, on the 17th of uh, of November at uh, at the same time in the UK and I believe an hour earlier in the US uh, where we've had to do some shifting around due to time zones for everybody who's joined us uh, from the US. Thank you very much. You have um, clearly made time in your diary to do so. And thank you, Dawn, uh, for, uh, thank for you. making that time uh, as well. Uh, I think that's a wrap. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. And, uh, and we hope to see you again next time. Thank you.